Um, hello, everybody. My name is Charity Counts. I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Midwest Museums. Uh, welcome to our very last awards program of the year, our 2022 AMM Promising Leadership Award virtual celebration event in honor of Stephen White. Uh, before we begin our program, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Chuck Wash to offer a land acknowledgement on behalf of AMM. Thank you, Charity. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Chuck Wash, the director of the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center in Wilberforce here in Ohio. Uh, we are a division of the Ohio History Connection. Um, in this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute our physical sense of place, it's important to redirect our attention, <clears throat> excuse me, to the land we each occupy in this moment and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. Because I'm located here in Ohio, I recognize that I am a guest in the original homeland of the living nations of the Miami tribe, the Shawnee tribe, the Eastern Shawnee tribe, the absentee Shawnee tribe, the Delaware nation, the Delaware tribe, the Wyandotte nation, the Seneca Cayuga tribe, the Seneca nation, the Ottawa tribe, Peoria tribe, Hokagon band of Potawatomi, Forest County Potawatomi, Tonawanda Seneca and others. I wish to recognize the strength and resilience of these and all indigenous peoples who have endured and continue steward the land that I am privileged to call home, in spite of the devastation of their land and lives as a result of colonialism, the misrepresentation of their cultures and heritage across time, including by museums and the ongoing struggle to be recognized in contemporary narratives. Please also consider this acknowledgement, a commitment from AMM to continue to reach out to and learn about the many indigenous communities and cultural centers located with connections to this Midwest region. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, before we begin the program, I want to offer a few housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, you're welcome to have your video on if you choose, but please keep your audio muted until we prompt you to unmute at different points of the program. Uh, this event is an opportunity for all of us to celebrate our recipients, but also to learn more about them and their work. Um, please feel free to comment or ask questions in the chat as we go, and we'll get those answered as soon as we can during Q&A later in the program. Um, we encourage you to react to what you're hearing today. You can do this a few different ways. Uh, there will be moments for audible applause, and we'll let you know about those. At that time, you can unmute and cheer and holler and whatever you would like to do. Um, we also encourage you to use the reactions tool in Zoom located in your menu. Uh, there is where you can offer a thumbs up or clap or other kinds of responses without audio. Uh, you can also wave and snap your fingers. Um, even if we can't hear you, we can see your response on screen. Uh, and finally, you will see that we have an ASL interpreter with us today. Uh, you can, well, you can pin her on your screen wherever you would like. I think in Zoom now, you could even drag and drop that video wherever you would like it to be on screen. Feel free to do that. If you have questions about how to uh, move the ASL interpreter up on your screen so you can see her, just let us know in the chat. For those of you getting to know AMN for the first time this evening, I'd like to provide some background on our organization and this program. Uh, AMM was founded in 1927, making us one of the very first museum associations in the United States. We serve an eight-state region, and our community includes traditional museums and historic sites, as well as art and science centers, cultural centers, zoos, and libraries. One of our favorite new programs started during the pandemic, and that is our virtual award celebrations, like the one this evening. Um, we really love these events because it's been an opportunity for us to learn more and share more about our recipients and really do a deep dive into their work um, and hear their perspectives on what their organizations are doing, what they're doing in their work, um, but also gather inspiration uh, that's applicable to all of our lives. And we also love these events because they're an opportunity to join live or watch them later. We are recording uh, for that very purpose today um, so that anybody who's not able to join us live has an opportunity to learn from the, the experience of our recipient later. And I wanna say thank you to all of you who've joined us live today. It's great that you've notched up this time to be with us and to celebrate Stephen 
Um, but I also want to thank those who watch this later uh, for tuning in and celebrating in your own way. Uh, thank you uh, also to our guest of honor, who uh, Stephen, who has organized a great program for us today, um, in addition to the awards presentation. I also want to um, give a shout out to Jana from the Ohio Museums Association, who's with us today too. She'll be saying a few words as a part of the program a little bit later. Uh, I also know that there's uh, at least one other board member from AMM on. So if you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself in the chat. And I encourage everybody else who's here with us to introduce yourselves too in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. I think that's it for opening remarks from me. Uh, so I'm gonna pass the mic back to Chuck to get the awards presentation started. All right, thank you again, Charity. Um, good evening once again, everyone. Um, the Promising Leadership Award, uh, it recognizes the commitment and service of individuals who have demonstrated leadership prowess through the implementation of projects or through service to teams and departments. Uh, this year's recipient is Stephen White at COSI right here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, as the Chief Strategy Officer at COSI, Stephen oversees areas in education, partnerships, external affairs, and business development. His work has supported COSI's vision and mission to engage, inspire, and transform lives throughout the pandemic. In response to the growing disparities in education, Stephen created and now leads the Learning Lunchbox model of engagement to deliver learning alongside meals at food banks, with the goal to, as he puts it, feed hungry lives and feed hungry minds. COSI has distributed over 100,000 learning lunchbox kits across 10 states and three countries to date, working with partners like NASA and scientist Camille Schreier, who's the former Miss America 2020. Stephen has also leveraged his extensive experience in public affairs from his previous tenure in the US Senate in support of museum advocacy. Stephen worked with federal officials on the bipartisan stimulus bill to include museums in the Save Our Stages provisions, which became the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program and testified to the Ohio legislature around innovative strategies to aid the museum industry during this uncertain time. Although Stephen is relatively new to the museum industry, his commitment to strengthening museums and work to serve those disproportionately impacted and underserved has already had an enormous impact on communities across Ohio and beyond. And I can personally attest to that. At this time, I invite everyone with us today to unmute, or as, as Charity pointed out, use the Zoom reaction icons to join me in a round of applause in honor of this year's Promising Leadership Award recipient, Mr. Stephen White. <laughs> hey. Thank you. Thank you. All right, yeah, so I see some people with, with the icons. Good job, good job. <laughs> so um, thank you. And I now invite John McEntee, I'm sorry, <laughs> Director of Ohio Museums Association to say a few words about why she nominated Stephen for this award. Well, thanks, Dr. Wash. Hello, everyone. My name is Jonna McEntee, and I'm the Executive Director of the Ohio Museums Association. And on behalf of OMA, I want to wish a heartfelt congratulations to Stephen on his well-deserved recognition through the Promising Leadership Award. I also want to say a warm thank you to the Association of Midwest Museums for recognizing Stephen's incredible dedication to education, advocacy, and community service with this prestigious award. Although Stephen hasn't been in the museum field for very long, he has dedicated his career towards addressing education equity through his leadership and his advocacy work. As demonstrated through his many accomplishments recognized by this award, but specifically through COSI's Learning Lunchboxes and Stephen's diligent advocacy work on behalf of museums during the height of the COVID pandemic, his efforts have not only served our museums and museum professionals in Ohio, but throughout the Midwest and across the country. As a point of personal privilege, OMA is also so proud to count Stephen not just as one of our members, but also as a vibrant member of our Board of Trustees, just one of his many leadership activities outside of his regular duties at COSI. Like I told Charity earlier, I could go on and on, but I will finish by saying congratulations again to Stephen. You truly represent what this award embodies. And thank you again to the Association of Midwest Museums for recognizing such a star as the amazing asset that he is in our field. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonna. Um, up next, we'll hear from Stephen, who will kick, then kick off the program portion of our event. Mr. White. Well, first off, a tremendous thank you, uh, Dr. Walsh, Jonah, Charity, uh, for those extremely kind words. Um, it was uh, um, it's an honor, uh, it's a privilege. Um, Charity, a, a big thank you to you for your um, incredible leadership uh, with the association and, and the work that you do serves not only uh, the 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 states in which you represent, but really the nation, um, and not only museums, but the communities in which it serves. And um, I just want to thank you for that, and, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, very, uh, really appreciate the the amazing uh, work that you do here in Ohio. Uh, as, as a partner and the work that you do every single day as a fellow colleague in the museum industry for, its, for the uh, appreciation and leadership that you show share here across Ohio you have been a, a tireless advocate um, and, and it's an honor to serve on the board uh, in which you in which you work and so I just want to thank you all for such a great those great kind words um, and many guests here today and I want to just thank everyone for for joining um you know I don't want today to be about me even though I know it's an award presentation um I have a presentation I'd like on um, this idea that has really been near and dear to my heart and you're going to hear that a lot uh, this idea of the heart quite a bit this evening um around what's what drives me uh as a uh, as, a, as an individual and the work that I do and the work that I've done over the course of my career and the work that I'll continue to do. And that's this idea of service and service minded uh, leadership. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. And then I'm going to transition and talk more with a partner um, who I've asked to join here today, um, Cassie with Franklin County Children's Services. And we're going to have a bit of a dialogue back and forth. <laughs> talk a little bit about the manifestation of service and why we do what we do as museum officials, um, as museum leaders, as an industry, as community partners um, for those that are not part of the museum industry um, that may be listening to this or, 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 or watching here, um, that we're all in this idea that we're all in it together. And so I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I come from, where I kind of got this idea of, of servant leadership um, and why it drives me the way it does. And so let me go ahead and see if I can share my screen here. Give me one second. Let's see if I can pull this up. As always, I've got too many windows open, so <laughs> bear with me for a moment. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, you're going to hear this idea of of a heart over and over again. You know what? You know what? And this is a fun. I, I you know I love this riddle. Um, by the way, it's it's a deck of cards for those <laughs> who are not aware. But I like sharing this riddle uh, just quite a bit to kind of kick things off. Just because you know when you talk about you know uh, service, right? You know service and and why we lead what we do. Or, you know, all each of us has a heart, right? Regardless of who you are where you're from and what your background is. And, you know, for myself, my personal life has really driven me in, in the work that I do in the official role and in, in, in my, what I call my day job, if you will. But what runs kind of the, the through line through all of that is this idea of service. And, you know, first and foremost, I can't do anything without my family and they're joining us here today and they're gonna pop on in a little bit and say a few words. Um, and, you know, just a huge shout out and thank you to my wife, Teresa, uh, uh, my, my son, Stephen Jr., and my daughter, Kira, for, the, for helping to inspire me every single day to do the work that I do. And, and so I'm um, excited to have them uh, say a few words here. But let me take you back, um, you know, where I came from, right? You know, this is my neighborhood growing up. Uh, this is Madisonville in Cincinnati, Ohio. This is kind of the main course here main street uh in the neighborhood i grew up uh madisonville down in cincinnati and 
a lot of a lot of positive experiences there in part because of family right the fab was very blessed uh, to have a mom and a dad who who understood the value of education and so one of the coolest things growing up that i loved was going to the library going to the library for me was like going to going to disneyland going to the park it was like a really awesome moment um and my favorite my favorite book growing up was the magic school bus and it was really that hunger for learning that was instilled upon me early on uh and and one of the reasons i was very blessed um because i had a, a mom and a dad there's my dad here with my with my older brother and uh myself growing up uh there there i am with the with the got the fro going there if you i'm going old school here uh yeah for those of you who maybe have never seen this photo before i got the box you know uh, growing up. And one of the things I understood um, early on was this idea of, of service and serving others. And it was because of my mom and dad and how they raised us, right? And they raised us with this idea of never give up, um, always work hard, and use true grit. And what I mean by that is that when you serve your community, you're going to have some hardships. You're going to have bumps in the road along your journey. And you got to have grit. You got to be able to pick yourself back up because life is not easy. And you got to, you got to, you got to keep moving forward, right? So this idea of servant leadership is is married with this idea of grit, right? This heart and grit. And we'll, we'll talk about that today. So here's a picture of my brother now that we've grown up, uh, sort of fast forward here. Uh, I've got my brother here. Uh, so again, part of that family. So I, I grew, you know, I was very blessed to have the opportunity to leave Cincinnati and come to Ohio State University. Um, where I had some great mentors along the way. You know, there's this idea that you can't do things alone. You need to be able to find those individuals in your life that can help you along your journey. And I was very blessed to have many of those individuals in my life to get me to where I am today. Individuals like Senator Glenn, who uh, was an American icon and a hero. Um, and I still remember till this day when I was in graduate school studying and having him roam the halls up and down, back and forth, talking about the importance of inspiring that next generation, leading with the heart to do that. I also had other great leaders and, and, and servants like that of Senator Portman, um, who was retiring this year um, from the U.S. Senate. He was the very first job I had coming out of graduate school. And you want to talk about public service. You want to talk about someone who who, who wakes up every day thinking about how can I help others that's the type of environment that I that I worked in immediately after I graduated from law school, um, going into the field and working in places like Washington, D.C. and across the great state of Ohio. Um, that's something that was near and dear to my heart. And I carried on as I as I went into multiple different uh, experiences like like experiences like this, helping to help individuals overcome opioid addiction. Uh, living right here in the city of Columbus and others, you know, it was those experiences that really helped guide me and inspire me to want to pursue and keep doing the things, having that grit and keep going. And it's the reason why I came to COSI. It's the reason why I made the transition to the museum industry, because I wanted to be those boots on the ground that, that would help make a difference in the community. Um, so this is our building, COSI, with Center of Science and Industry based in Columbus, Ohio. It's three football fields long. I'm a huge Bengals fan. Uh, so if any Bengals fans out there are watching or listening right now, uh, three football fields long, three international space stations long. And I had other mentors like that of our current CEO, Dr. Bertley, uh, Dr. Frederick Bertley, who you see here on the right. Again, another individual that helps to guide me and push me every single day around this idea of service. You know, how are we helping those that are underserved living in our community and fueling their excitement around hunger and learning and how do we push them and support them in their personal journey. And so it's one of those things where, again, you cannot do it alone. And I'm very blessed to have individuals who have helped me get to where I am today to be able to work at a science museum, right? It's the coolest job ever to be able to come in and make clouds for people uh, you know, how, how it doesn't get much better than that, right? Uh, going from the environment of law school to extending my education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, all of those are really great opportunities. But it's opportunities to help serve. 
So when we look at the problems facing our community right now, really big challenges, right? You know, the pandemic has really set us back in a lot of different ways, going from this environment to the at-home environment. Um, and, and, our, and our community is struggling. Like the learning loss is real, um, particularly for students in rural communities in, 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 in the inner city. Um, and when you look at math and STEM and education, um, we see that this COVID can is real. And so the question is, how do you close the gap? Well, I submit to you that servant leadership is a way to do that work. And those individuals that I shared with you earlier, they believe that too. Mother Teresa said, you can do things that I can do. I can do things that you uh, cannot do, but together we can do great things. You know, Dr. King told us that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. And you look at individuals like Robert Greenleaf, who coined the term servant leadership. He recognized and by that looking at through it, and then there's a book I challenge everyone, to, if you have a moment to read called The Journey to the East, that those leaders that help to lift others up are those leaders that can really make a profound impact. And it's not about focusing on other people's needs. It's about focusing on other people's needs, not their feelings. What do they need in their community? And by, by, by uplifting someone else, you can become more of that leader. So it begins with the heart, right? You know, the heart is a very powerful organ, you know, pumps about 2,000 blood, you know, pounds of blood every, every day, right? It's a very powerful organ. And so when you think about the heart, um, you know, those gallons that get pumped, it's, and you combine that with this idea of leadership and the point that I made earlier that everybody has the heart. Well, then anybody, anybody can be a leader, right? Regardless of who you are, or what you, where you're from. And if you combine this idea of heart and grit, you can really manifest that, manifest that leadership. Um, so there's a couple principles out there that I'm just going to highlight very quickly. And one is this idea of the heart and grit model. Um, and this is something that I live and breathe through every day in the work that I do in, in the education through the education lens. So really quick, 10 of these, this idea of healing, helping people to heal in their own life, um, both mentally and physically, using leading with empathy um, to understand their intentions and their perspectives, having the awareness to look at yourself and how they are impacting and affecting others. Uh, this idea of responsibility, taking responsibility for the actions and the roles that you can play to those around you. Being a trailblazer, helping to conceptualize and understand the path that you're on and knowing as a leader where you can go to support others along that path. Don't do it alone. You know, use those powers of partnerships. And then also having that, that, that understanding of, you know, the personal, professional and development of others, you know, along the way. Reflecting, reflecting on the past, what worked, what didn't work, and how do, can you be, use that as foresight for your, for, your, for your future leadership and inspiring others, persuading them to also come alongside you to help do that work. Truth seeing, this idea that if you can truly listen to what people need, then you can understand what they're saying. So those are 10 kind of really key concepts that I, I, I live with every single day. And I want to share with you in action, you know, uh, you know, what that looks like, right? So, you know, when we talk about this idea of the learning lunchbox, it's really about the digital, physical, and through a partnership model. And, and we've done this here at COSI, living, kind of living through these 10 prisms here in the work. And that's why I love working at a museum, because it enables us to have that. So, for example, on the digital front, we have a digital program called COSI Connects. We listened to the problem. We understood that people needed resources during the middle of the pandemic. And we created a, a web portal to help solve some of those problems. But we were aware because we knew some people didn't have access to the internet. So what we did is we said, okay, let's create a mobile app. Uh, if you don't have access to Wi-Fi, like here in the state of Ohio, uh, we also know that those making less than $30,000 a year have access to a smartphone. Um, so uh, let's meet them where they are. We created an app with offline functionality by having that awareness. Then we took the digital, the physical side. We took all that content and we put it into a box. That's what created this idea of the learning lunchbox to meet people where they are, the most vulnerable in our community, to help them heal both mentally and physically and close that COVID canyon that I shared with earlier. So this is the first one we did. The kid opened the box. It was like Christmas morning, right? And we're like, wow, this is great. Uh, and it launched the learning lunchbox program. You see the, the box here on the right-hand side. What's in that box? 
over 10 hours of content, uh, STEM content that we deliver, everything from batteries to binoculars are included inside of each one. We were we understood some people didn't have access to items. And so we needed to make sure that everything was in that box that they needed. And then we expanded into different themes uh, through partnerships like NASA, where we could create their own box around going to the moon and going to Mars through beautiful design uh, activity books, partnering with them around the Artemis mission and James Webb. Uh, you could kind of see here what those kits look like with digital augmentation. Hey, congratulations on your first NASA kit. With and leaders like hearing directly from the NASA CEO there. Um, and then the energy box, working with the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, being able to connect uh, folks to those type of fields. Hyperloop, you know, uh, working with the Branson team uh, to be able to create this uh, kit. Miss America that was mentioned earlier, uh, Camille Schreier all around breaking stereotypes of what it means to be in STEM. A nature kit all around weather resiliency, climate change, even a snow kit that we launched with the Iditarod race in Alaska uh, and the White House as well, uh, helping to promote uh, this idea that space and looking up at the stars can be for anyone. And then we also knew that it needed to connect to standards, right? Reflecting on the, the fact that we knew that we had to deliver content that was directly connected uh, to that content, to those standards. So we deliver these all over the country, all over the world, and then we do so at meal distribution sites. And so you can see the demand being very heavy, lots of people showing up, trying to get their the, the access to these resources, but then partnering with community leaders, again, inspiring action, helping them to see that they too have a role. Um, to, to execute this and to help solve these community problems. And so we also focus on human services, you know, commitment to growing people. Um, so whether it be a mom in recovery or a, a homeless family or those that are immigrant uh, population help welcome into the community through this lens of partnerships, helping to uplift other museums along the way through this idea that a rising tide lifts all boats. And Right now, we're very fortunate to have really over 400 partners as part of this. And we have a national impact, you know, over 300,000 of these being delivered over the next two years, collecting that data, right? Knowing that we have to take responsibility. If we're going to create a tool like this, we need to make sure that it's effective. And so we collect that data. And so we you now we have global impact uh, working with the State Department uh, to places like the World Fair in Dubai. Um, to really, again, inspiring them. Science is everywhere and for everyone, regardless of where you're from. You can kind of see them literally getting excited, uh, even from, from London to France uh, to even Barbados, right? And so uh, we, we're super honored to have this global impact um, across the globe. And we know that you can't do it alone. And I want to give a very special shout out to the fact that, you know, creating a, a, a program like this does not happen overnight. It takes a lot of people moving in the right, right direction. We have a philosophy at COSI of this one team model. And this program that the Learning Lunchbox that we just that I just talked about um, includes so many people to help execute. It is truly a team effort and a team dynamic. And so I also want to give a, a shout out to the entire COSI team uh, for the tireless work that they do to help inspire that next generation through this lens of heart and true grit. And I want to take a moment and I want to introduce someone who um, I asked to join here today um, because of the incredible work that she does. I want to do two stories before I make that transition. One is, um, I want to share this image of this young girl here. Um, we gave out one of these kits at a local park and she started doing a science experiment right there on the slide. And we were like, oh my gosh, that's what you mean when you talk about engagement in helping to close that gap by delivering it to her directly in the parking lot. And then we also wanted to connect the dots with when we started this program initially, we wanted to make sure that we were helping to truly support those partners in the work that they were doing. And the first partner, the very first partner that stepped up uh, to help us um, was, was Franklin County Children's Services. Um, combined with with uh, with um, uh, the food providers that we were going to be partnering with. Um, and so they stepped up and said, hey, we'd love to partner with you, COSI. 
um, and be able to help support the work that they were doing uh, to help inspire so many. And so I'd like to just take a moment. And, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about um, this idea of servant Learn so servant leadership and what it means to lead with the heart and have true grit. And so I've asked Cassie to be here today. Hi, Cassie. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Um, and I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking to Cassie a little bit about, you know, when we talk about ideas around servant leaders, Cassie is is representing that leadership. I mean, she she does it all, right? Over at Franklin County Children's Services. So I want to ask her a little bit about what she does. And I want to ask her a little bit about what she's seen as a result of our work together. And the reason for that is because my hope is, is that collectively we see as an industry, through, whether it be through the museum lens or just the informal learning lens in general, how we can work together to really help support and uplift other people. And so, Cassie, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Maybe, maybe you could just introduce yourself and tell, tell us a little bit about what you do. Absolutely. So my name is Cassie Snyder. I am the Associate Director of Adoptions and our Youth Transition Services Department at Franklin County Children's Services. Um, so our agency is a public child welfare agency. We are involved in protecting the safety and well-being of all children within our county. Um, and our agency obviously strives to maintain children in their homes. Um, children that are facing abuse, neglect, dependency, um, our goal is always to keep them in the homes. Unfortunately, there are certain times where we cannot ensure their safety and they do have to be removed from their home and placed into congregate care. So these learning lunch boxes have been an absolute blessing for us because we've been able to do so much with them on so many different levels. Um, it's just been fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Cassie, and thanks for the work that you're doing on a day in and day out basis for these youth and the families. Uh, let's just start there, if we could. Um, so, so, so one of the things we were really one of, and this was really a back and forth, right? As we were creating these kits for the first time, we were trying to understand and think through, you know, what are some applications as to how they could be deployed, not just at a food bank with organizations like the Children's Hunger Alliance and the Middle Ohio Food Bank here locally uh, and other food banks, but in actual settings where human services were taking place. So can you give us some examples about what, how, how the kits have been used uh, to help fuel some of the family dynamics uh, that you're trying to help create and build and strengthen? Absolutely. So initially, when we started our partnership with COSI and, and Mr. White, um, our initial thought process was implementing these boxes into our parent-child visitations. So these are visitations where a child has been removed from their parent, and they get our weekly visitation supervised in our office. And part of our idea around this was based on the impact of COVID pandemic, um, we were not be able to allow families to bring their own items into the visitation. So there was no outside items that could come in. So these families were sitting there with their children and talking, but they didn't have much to interact or engage with. So these learning lunch boxes provided an outlet for our, our parents and our children and actually encouraged the engagement and communication between the parents and children during their visitation time. And having these structured activities during their visits actually allowed the parents to learn new ways to interact with their children with an educational structure while also strengthening their relationship and parent-child bond. It's really contributed to the social and emotional well-being of all members of those visits while <clears throat> encouraging that bond to continue. So it's actually been incredibly impactful to those families and, and children that were able to engage in those. And outside, after we started implementing in there, we, we realized there were so many other aspects we could use them for outside of just the parent-child visits. And, uh, and that's where something we really picked up on. And, you know, I will say that there were, there were areas of opportunity for um, really, again, looking at kind of the foresight model, which is that, you know, what's working well, what's not working, how do you refine things to make them even more robust? I'll give you a quick example. And again, just a shout out to Cassie here for her feedback along the way, um, is that, you know, we realize that, hey, these kits are being used in some instances where, um, you know, the, the parents um, and or mom and or dad um, are trying to connect with their 
with their child, uh, but they may not necessarily be comfortable around science, right? And so, you know, one of the things we, we strive to work on is helping to promote science literacy. Again, this idea of science is everywhere for everyone, but we also want to make sure that people are comfortable around science. So that way they say, wow, yeah, I can do that thing. Um, it's not scary. You know, it's, it's, it's actually fun, right? It's, it's, you know, um, it's highly engaging. It's easy. Um, and what we found was if we could provide some tools to help uh, ease that level of comfort, it made things a lot easier. So for example, little things like creating photos and diagrams uh, through the activity guide. So it's not just all words, right? You can kind of, you can demonstrate it through uh, photos. So for example, if you're gonna you know, do the rocket launch activity, you know, show the photos of the, you know, in the activity book of someone breaking the Alka-Seltzer tablets and putting it into the water, closing the lids, and then communicating the science behind the pressure there. Um, or in the alternative, making a video uh, that you could just simply watch, right? So you don't have to read anything. You can watch a, a, a COSI team member um, actually doing the activity. And you could say, wow, okay, that looks easy. That's not hard at all. Um, and so breaking down some of those little nuances we, we found to be very helpful along the way. Absolutely agreed. And even having, um, cause when, when the children do come in for parent child visitation, we have staff generally supervising. So even having the staff well-versed on what the next activity was, just in case they needed a little more reinforcement and support to do those activities with their children, it really benefited. And in addition to that, sometimes if the children took the lead on those activities, it really promoted their self-esteem and made them feel like they were helping teach their parents. And it kind of gave like a different effect than anything we expected, but it was all incredibly positive and it increased the interaction with the, with the child and the family. That's incredible. And then uh, Cassie, just another follow-up question. Um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, really tough, right? I mean, a different type of environment in which you were working in. I mean, obviously your work is helping to, to really build these families up for the future, but I imagine that there were some challenges related to COVID in, in that type of dynamic of being able to engage physically and, and uh, things of that nature. What, what, what were some of those challenges that you saw? Well, I believe it was like March 21st where we all just got sent home and everything was virtual. <laughs> so um, as social workers, we thrive on face-to-face -face engagement with families. So having to really learn how to navigate the virtual world of uh, visits and doing everything virtually, um, having contact with parents virtually, even for, I think it was about a three month period, we didn't have any in-person visits. It was all virtual visits between the parents and the children. Um, so bringing them back in person was wonderful because they could hug their kids, they could spend time with their kids, but at the same time, without the resources of being able to have activities to do, it really kind of hindered their true interaction and engagement during the visit. So these co-sci boxes really just, they, they brought forth a, a new positive interaction that we could give them without being able to bring the special things. Like we always encourage them to bring special things from home, like games that the kids enjoy when they were at home, things they used to do together, coloring. And we couldn't encourage any of those things to come into our office space. So the boxes were absolutely by far the best thing we could have been able to do um, to really help these families engage with each other through this really difficult transition. Yeah, absolutely difficult transition. And I think, you know, for, for those that are, um, um, you know, listening to this, you know, I, I hope one of the takeaways is that, you know, when you look at the informal learning space, um, there are ways that you can engage with human service elements um, that can help amplify, force, force multiply and amplify the work that they are doing on the ground. So whether it's a kit or whether it is a digital program, or whether it is a board game, or whatever it is that you may create, an art activity um, as an informal learning institution, a la museum, a la library, whatever it might be, um, there are ways that you can work directly with your human service uh, partners out there to help them do their work. Um, and, and I think, Cassie, your leadership is... Uh, it's been a, a testament, you know, we even had 
um, the Harvard Business School come out and talk a little bit about the work that you're doing in, in that. How, can you just speak to that? How what, what were your thoughts about that experience? That experience is wonderful. I really enjoyed um, their insight, like looking at what was going really well and what we could amplify to make it even better. And some of the ideas that they brought forward with how to take those boxes and even though they finished the box and they've done all of the activities, how to continue that learning past the activities within that box. Um, so they really, I think, gave a lot of really good ideas. And I think the, um, although we started in the area of the parent-child visitation, the way we were able to expand outside, even to the teenagers up to 20 years old, um, to really engage them. And although the boxes weren't even created for the engagement of 20-year-olds, it really, we were able to really um, get, bring it down to their level because when you think about all the children in foster care and the trauma that they've experienced, their academic and educational growth has been stunted. Um, even their emotional growth has been stunted it's to some aspect. So these boxes actually really engage them to a level I never expected. So some of the feedback Harvard was able to give us just to continue to engage all these ages was incredible. That's it's spot on. I completely agree with you. It was just a great, great experience overall. And, you know, one last thing before I let you go here, Cassie, I'm um, just a, a big thank you. You know, one of the most rewarding uh, things that I do um, that is outside kind of COSI is the mentoring program that you have at Franklin County Children's Services and being able to, uh, I have this opportunity to, uh, you know, every few months, uh, engage with a new cohort of uh, of youth uh, to to help see themselves as leaders, um, and so just a big shout out to you and the whole team and the work that you're doing uh, through not only the the programs that you do day in and day out, but also your mentorship programs that you offer uh, to these youth as well. I think it's just a phenomenal uh, phenomenal work that you do. Well, thank you, and thank you for everything you've done for us because without you, some of these these things that we've been able to do with our families and our teenagers and really inspiring them to look at STEM related careers. And I know you've even had youth reach directly out to you for different referrals and, and interests. It's just been phenomenal to see their interest really blossom in STEM. It's been great. And we very much value our partnership with you. Well, we value your partnership as well. And, um, you know, I hope that this was a good um, you know, conversation and example uh, to that, you know, the power, right, the power of museums, the power of informal learning to help um, really change lives in a very positive way. And you can do so through servant leadership, and you can do so with with heart, and you could do so with grit as well. And so, um, Charity, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you for allowing me to say a few words and allow me to uh, the honor of, of asking Cassie to join us here today. Cassie, thank you so much um, for joining tonight. And, and uh, it really means a lot. It's uh, very special. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate your partnership as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, that's, this has been really great, Stephen. Um, it was fun to hear more about your um, your career path and also your childhood. I feel like just in these the planning call for this event and today's event, I've learned a lot more about you and I can absolutely see the connection between the Magic School Bus and the Learning Lunchbox program. I just see a direct link right there. Um, but be Cassie, before you turn off your video or, or uh, disappear today, I, I wanna ask you a question um, as a partner of COSI and you know, having collaborated with Stephen and others there. You know, I feel like when organizations work together, they learn a lot about each other um, in that process. And I'm curious if working with a museum for the first time, particularly COSI and working with Stephen, if anything about this surprised you, you know, uh, or opened your mind or ideas, your, your, I guess your eyes to new possibilities or, you know, anything that resulted from it that you didn't expect? <laughs> um, well, I... In regards to COSI, I've been a member of COSI for many years. I have children and they love going to COSI. <laughs> so, so we were familiar with like the aspect of COSI and all the excellent activities they have there. Um, but the boxes were just a different level because you could actually, you don't have to be in the museum to do them. You can come home, you can open the box. And I bought some boxes for my kids too. So they did the boxes as well. <laughs> um, just because I saw 
you know, the kids at, at the agency doing them. And I was like, this is so amazing. And I brought the boxes home and my kids would spend hours sitting there with the boxes, like doing it and they don't sit still. So, <laughs> so watching them sit still and do these boxes and be completely engaged. And my son is four. So even he was like engaged with my daughter doing them. It was just amazing. And, and then taking that and realizing how it, these boxes can span across two decades of kids, like these, these kids all enjoyed them, even up to 20. It was just amazing to see that even though, you know, they're 20 and they're functioning as an independent person and they're living in apartments, even though they've been involved with us, they're still able to sit back and, and learn from these and see different aspects of STEM and see different aspects of, of job related act, like job related things you can do with these boxes. It was really incredible to see the impact that these boxes had on each youth individually. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you for, for sharing. I had to ask before you um, were off. I have a couple questions for Stephen, and then I wanna make sure that anybody else who's on um, who might wanna say something uh, about Stephen or say a few words before we go, gets an opportunity to do that. Um, so Stephen, you talked a bit about servant leadership in the context of community engagement, especially, and you referenced the one team concept, but I'm curious what servant leadership looks like internally. Like, what does that look like between you and your staff and you and your coworkers? Really great question. Um, you know, it's one wherein uh, I look at it as um, supporting the growth of, of the person. Um, of the individual. And so for me personally, it is when I'm working with colleagues, it's about how do I really enable and support them so that way they can pursue their career goals and their career journeys? How can I help support them excel at their skills and what they want to accomplish? And so it might be lending a hand here or there, but it's also allowing them to help find them on their own path and then supporting them along that journey. Um, and then helping them to understand and, and realize that there are gonna be wrinkles in the road. It's gonna be a windy road, uh, but you'll get there. You'll get there and you know, even though there may be setbacks, by working together, we can get through that and we can help accelerate and, and make, make those goals a reality. Um, but you gotta make it fun. You gotta make it exciting. Um, you know, we have this, one of the things about uh, the reason I love working at COSI so much is because we have this environment of, yes, it's one team, but it's a team that supports each other, that cares about each other. And when you're, and when you're living in an environment where you are leading with the heart, you've got that empathy, uh, that can manifest really amazing experiences in the workplace and, and, and through friendships. Um, so that's kind of how I view it. Um, and that's kind of my sort of philosophy around how I do my work and how I support others. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I saw a kid question come in um, in the chat here. Um, have you done any kits that add art? So from STEM? Oh, absolutely. Um, every single one of our kits has an art component. So this idea of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, you know, is real, right? We we incorporate that in all of our kits. So for example, in our, uh, I'll give you just a quick example. We have an activity called chromatography flowers um, that we use in, in some of our kits. Uh, and it's about this idea of, you know, you can use markers to kind of create a beautiful flower, um, but you can, you can demonstrate the science at the same time, specifically around water. I'll give you another example. Um, we're developing the James Webb Telescope Kit right now, and um, one of the ways that we are we are one of the ways we are helping to inspire that next generation is by creating the night sky. But you create the night sky by using making a jar um, using various different materials um, uh, that create a beautiful manifestation of that inside the jar that looks like the night sky. But you get to make it your own um, through art. Um, and so absolutely, I think it's an, it's a, you know, I think it's critical that you, you know, I didn't talk about this when I was during my presentation, because I was stuck on the magic school bus, uh, but art was a big, uh, was a big um, proponent of my childhood. I was, a, I was into art all the way through high school, 
um, did you know higher AP art art courses till this day. I'm an amateur cartoonist, um, so it's a fun fact of mine, you know, hobby. Um, and so I think art just just embodies you know so many different things that we can do throughout our life, uh, and it's embedded in so much that we do on a daily basis, not just STEM, uh, STEAM related concepts, but just life in general. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I have one more question. Uh, just I'd like to ask our individual recipients kind of a big question. Um, so I'll ask this and then we'll have a few minutes for other remarks. Um, what would you see as the greatest challenge facing museums in the next five to 10 years? You know, as a, as a promising leader and, and the work that you're doing and what you're seeing and hearing, what do you think that is? I would say coming out of the pandemic, I think right now is a moment a moment in time for museums to take the amazing work that they're doing physically in the building and to help elevate that same work in the communities in which they serve in a different way than we've done in the past. Um, I think now with the, with the pandemic, really creating some new paradigms in how you can create. Museums have done different things during the pandemic. I don't want us to go back to the things that we were doing necessarily uh, pre-pandemic, because the pandemic provided us with an opportunity to really ignore the box and think differently about how to engage both our community leaders, um, as well as those um, families and 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 and, and uh, learners in the community. Um, and so, my my hope and my aspiration is that our us as an industry, we double down, we triple down on some of the things that we've tried. Um, and see see how we can continue to grow and make that impact in the community, and, and I think um, and I think it's needed, right? I think it's needed now more than ever because I talked about the problem early on, um, and my fear is that that problem continues to grow. Those gaps that we talked about um, for those children living in the urban communities and the rural communities, those students with special needs. Uh, my fear is that this isn't a two-year issue. This could be a 10-year issue, right? And so we need to come together as a community in each of our communities to help solve that problem. Otherwise, we're going to be dealing with a lot more issues um, if we can't support um, these children and get them back to where um, they need to be, which was already a problem beforehand, By the, I might add. Right. You know, the gaps have always been there. What COVID did was expose it and exacerbate some of those problems. And so I think to answer your question, Charity, I think it's a the challenge for us as an industry is to say, OK, the pandemic is, 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 is moving behind us. Do we revert back to kind of where we were, which was OK. Museums have always been community anchors, but we can always have that stronger community impact. And so can we take what Something we've done? Can we take try again. can we take what we've done and continue that growth over time? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your your thoughts for the future. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I know you have family um, who is on. Want to introduce your two uh, kiddos to us? Well, or... I, I, I know that <laughs> I think they may have had to jump off. Um, I was well, getting text messages. Um, I'm not sure, Teresa, are you on? I'm not sure if she's. Uh, uh, I see her watching, but I wasn't sure if. Oh, she's on. Okay. Oh, I'm going to show you. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I'm not sure. I, see, I see hands clapping and heart. I don't know. <laughs> if Teresa, Teresa, uh, you're on mute. If you want to say anything, you're welcome to. Yeah, uh, you don't have to say a camera, maybe just use words. Um, but that's okay. That's okay too. We've got two little ones. We've got, I've got the 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 um four year old almost six year old right now so um yeah uh, but yeah no that's uh that's great I appreciate everyone being on today it's been a this has been an unbelievable unbelievable night well we're excited to celebrate you and I just want to ask everybody one more time to um, unmute or use your uh, reaction icons and let's cheer one more time for Stephen and congratulating him on his promising leadership award congratulations Stephen. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, 
Chuck, anything you want to say uh, before we wrap up today, our final um, awards program of the season? Um, not much more to add. I'm, I mean, it's just super, super impressed with everything that you've done. Uh, we've said it a couple of times, you're relatively new to the field, but your impact is just, I mean, just reverberating, right? I've, I've, I heard about your work before I knew you, knew anything about you personally, um, and, and Cassie as well. Interestingly enough, my wife is a mental health therapist, and mm -hmm. she leads a school-based team for Children's Hospital here in Columbus. And at one point in time, I had a truck full of your kits in my car, <laughs> helping her transport them to some of the schools that, that they work with. Um, so their, their impact is, is just, I have no words for that. So just again, congratulations. And, and one, one last thing, you, you are doing a phenomenal job of just keeping your, um, just, I don't, I don't even know the words, just how you're still upbeat, you know, considering what happened last weekend, just, you know, Ohio State <laughs> getting beat down by Michigan. Um, <laughs> You're still so positive. I'm I'm really impressed with you. So, <laughs> congratulations. So, so it's uh, my, my, it's only tempered by the fact that my bangles are still um, are, are are moving in the right direction. So I've got something I can like something I can hang my hat on uh, yeah. to keep, keep keep me going. Um, <laughs> I, see, I see you rocking the blue shirt there. So I, I yeah, didn't, right didn't, the didn't skip a beat on that one. <laughs> I know we've got at least one other Ohio State fan in the audience today, so <laughs> it hurts. Um, okay, well, <laughs> this has been great. Stephen, congratulations again, um, and thanks to everybody who could join us this evening and to everyone who listens back home later on the recording. Um, I want to ask uh, Chuck, Stephen, and Jonna to stay on for a quick photo op at, after everybody's out of the Zoom today. And I hope everybody has a nice evening and a great holiday season, however you celebrate. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank you.